the NRA, um, school recycling club and operator training town and gown webinar, indoor air quality and green cleaning. Today we have the speakers as being Cindy Sterling, the NRA, NRRA grants manager and educator, and Sarah McGraw, school program special projects manager. If you have any questions, please write them in the presentation bar, and we will try to address as many as time allows after the presentation is complete, and we can always pause in the middle of the presentation as well. If we don't answer your questions today, please email us at info at nrra.net referencing today's presentation, and a staff member will get back to you. So welcome, community educators and environmental ambassadors. The development of this presentation is credited in part to the USDA Rural Development Programs. And the objectives of our program with USDA is so that each group is equally well-versed in the importance of indoor air quality and proper supply purchasing, such as no VOC point paints and cleaning supplies, toxic substances, handling, storage, and disposal. We also want to take down the wall that can exist between towns and schools by encouraging increased cooperation in waste reduction and pollution prevention programs that benefit the entire community, primarily hazardous materials management, on-site storage, collection, and reduction, because that affects the indoor air quality of your building. And then we're doing the town and gown, sort of a cross training here. So it expands participation in NRRA's education programs through the online learning. So once we're done with this grant, we will have all of our training programs, the ones that we do for schools, as well as the ones that we do for operators on site, we will have them online as webinars. So you can see what they are all about, and then we can come and do more in-depth training at your facility or in your school or somewhere in your town. So we are training the operators to become environmental ambassadors for the community schools by giving facility tours and working with NRRA school club educators to introduce any hazardous waste education and training to targeted schools. Our hope is that you know training the operators will help them work with the local schools to create a solid connection between the schools and the local solid waste operators and hopefully reduce redundancies in waste hauling, saving money for the towns and facilitating the removal of potentially hazardous wastes in schools. Also, I just wanna put in a little plug that um, after the webinar has ended, you will receive a webinar evaluation to help us understand your knowledge and the steps you want to take to assist your community with managing materials comprehensively. Once you submit the evaluation, we will send out your webinar certificates that you can get professional development credits for. So a little bit about us. In 1981, we started off as just four New Hampshire municipalities. Uh, we were the New Hampshire Resource Recovery Association. And we're still doing what we did back then. We're just doing it in a bigger scale, a clearinghouse for current and up-to-date information and a source of technical and marketing assistance in the general areas of waste reduction and recycling. But in 1995, we amended to cover the entire Northeast. We expanded beyond the New Hampshire borders. And so we are marketing the goods. We are that one-stop shop for all things recycling. Uh, we've gone beyond just recycling in our trainings now and, and what we hope to deal with in the solid waste management stream. We now are working with everything from trash to construction and demolition debris to freon removal and also to recycling from single stream and contracts with your individual material vendors. And a little bit about the club. It offers K through 12 classroom workshops, technical assistance, produces a monthly newsletter and has lesson plans tied to the Common Core and puts on an annual school recycling conference. And so um, if you joined us for the Healthy Home Clean Waters webinar that we did on June 8th, not too long ago, we do have at the end of this webinar as well, we plugged in a activity that's really great for the classroom 
from our teaching toxics curriculum and it's wading through water pollution. But we're just going to see if there's time. So why are we here today? Because we care about the health of our students, because we care about chemical exposure to our staff, because we care about toxins entering our environment, and because we want to learn more about replacing toxic products with green products. And I'd like to just put out a little plug. This is a place that you don't have to ask a question, but maybe if you want to um, put a comment in instead, uh, if we were doing this on site, this is the time that we would say, we would ask the audience, how many of you currently use environmentally preferable cleaning products? What do you think about them? So if you feel like it, let's start the conversation now. Please share your experience with us today by typing your message in the dashboard on the right of your screen. So why is IAQ and green cleaning so important? Many still assume that the cleaners we use are safe to use, surprisingly, even in 2018. However, repeated exposure to some of the toxins increases health risks to employees and students. Most workplaces and schools use cleaning supplies containing toxic chemicals. As a part of this grant, we've been going through doing indoor air quality assessments in New Hampshire and Vermont schools, and they're free. Usually it's a program that we would be charging for under the school club technical assistance services. But so a little plug here, if you're interested in us coming to your school, the grant ends at the end of September. So we still have funds available to visit you in the summertime. We know like maybe the staff isn't going to be there, possibly not even the principals, but the uh, custodians are still there. So if the custodian in a school that you know may be interested in this and doesn't have to go to the higher powers to get the okay for it, we'd love to still do a few more of our indoor air quality assessments for free. And um, the, they are still using cleaning supplies that have toxic chemicals we found. Exposure to cleaning toxins can cause health risks to your employees and even greater risk to the children whose vital organs are still developing. And do you know what toxic chemicals are in your workplace? Again, you can send that little comment on the sidebar if you'd like. Do you know what toxic chemicals are in your workplace? The good news is that there are now products that are just as effective that are cost compar comparable and are more environmentally friendly. So green cleaning can save money. You know, maybe a decade ago, it wasn't going to save money because the products uh, were more expensive. Uh, but now they really are. We've talked to many vendors um, and they sell them. Mm -hmm. They are comparable. They really are from the toxic to the green cleaning ones. It does increase productivity. It improves employee and student health and safety. And best of all, bonus, it protects the environment by removing toxins from surfaces and the air. So what affects indoor air quality? We have things such as your copier, that water leak in the basement, aerosol fresheners, and even art products can all affect your IAQ. The volatile organic compounds are found in cleaning products and processes, pests and pesticides, scented products, and as I said, the art products. The EPA has a subheading under the State School Environmental Health Guidelines called The Importance of Environmental Health in K through 12 schools. Here are just a few of their findings. What I found important was the correlation between environmental health and students' attendance and test scores. So a child's developing organ system are highly sensitive to the environmental risk and children are frequently more heavily exposed to toxic substances in the environment than our adults. And that's due to their size, the fact that they're still developing, and also they do a lot of hand and mouth activity. Today, children are spending 90% of their time indoors, and much of that time is spent in school. So an unhealthy school environment can affect your children's health, attendance, concentration, and performance, as well as lead to expensive, time-consuming cleanup and remediation activities. Schools in better physical condition report improved academic performance, while schools with fewer janitorial personnel and higher maintenance backlogs report poorer academic performance. 
a study of the costs and benefits of green schools for Washington State estimated a 15% reduction in absenteeism and a 5% increase in test scores. And again, you can find all this information at this link, the importance of environmental health in K through 12 schools on the EPA state school environmental health guidelines on their website. Cleaning health risks. Here are just a few of the health risks to both employees and students. Asthma is really big in school these days. We've spoken to a lot of nurses as well as, as we've gone through the IAQ assessments and it's just surprising the amount of students that have asthma now. Bronchitis, coughing, throat irritation, nervous system damage, skin rashes was another big one. We, um, uh, as we've been going around doing this, a lot of the janitors and kitchen staff spoke about having skin rashes uh, from the chemicals that they use in their job. Fatigue, developmental problems, kidney and liver damage, cancer, birth defects, and infertility even, all from your cleaning products. And as I mentioned earlier, the effects on children um, is because of the size. So this graphic is from the EPA and it shows the proportion of risk to the children versus adults. Children exposed to the same dose of environmental toxins and or chemicals have proportionately much greater exposure compared to adults. Okay, so you can't get there from here. <laughs> so in other words, you have to know where you are first to get where you want to be. And when looking at uh, implementing this type of program, so starting small is good. And we'll be talking about the assessment, the IEAQ and green cleaning assessment that NRA conducts at schools. So the first step in the process is to assess your current status by conducting an audit of your cleaning products and practices. Then we do a thorough review, uh, both inside of and outside your buildings for potential hazards and looking for um, potential ways that either insects can you know, get into your school from having shrubbery near your building to leaks and all that. Later, we will research the chemicals in your cleaning products, and then you'll receive a report complete with findings and recommendations to move your program forward, which we'll share with your staff, and everybody should be on the same page. So again, so what is NRA's IAQ evaluation can provide. So it's an on-site customized inventory, evaluation of interior exterior, detailed review of report with recommendations, and the ongoing follow-up and support. So we don't just hand off the report and hope for the best. We can answer any questions that you may have that pop up during your move to cleaner product, greener, cleaner products. And of course, employee education. And through this USDA grant, we can provide free, again, IAQ assessments to school staff until about mid-September. So definitely jump on board and email us if you want to get one of those assessments done. Okay, so we're going into some practices here. So <clears throat> what's the difference between cleaning, sanitizing, and disinfecting? The following data is from Informed Green Solutions, which was started by Carol Westinghouse and the EPA. And Carol's Cleaning for Healthier Schools is a green cleaning training for Vermont schools. And she pioneered this program as a concerned parent. Um, so she really had um, a big stake in this and she was really passionate about this program. So we've kind of um, been trained by her to look at this. So cleaning, cleaning physically removes viruses, fungi, and bacteria in conditions they need to survive. So basically just removing anything that's on the surface of a desk or, or school lunch table. Use the detergent and water to physically remove dirt, grime. This process does not necessarily kill the germs, just removing the, the what's on top and removes mold and allergens that can trigger asthma symptoms. 
has been found to remove as much as 99% of germs when cleaning with microfiber. Um, and that's a recommendation that we have in our report is to switch over from cotton to using microfiber, which picks up more of the, that dirt and grime. So then we think about sanitizing. So sanitizing reduces bacteria and uh, mostly found in food prep areas. So sanitizing does not necessarily eliminate all the bacteria on a treated surface. Sanitizers do not have claims for viruses and fungi. Reduces the number of germs on hard surfaces or objects to a safer level, so at least 99.9%. .9%. For food surfaces, the level should be a 99.999% reduction in microorganisms within 30 seconds. <clears throat> Sanitizing produced products should state on their label the surfaces they are intended to be used on. So we'll repeat this as we go through, but really we want to push reading labels, not only for the type of chemicals that are on there, but for the directions that are stated. Um, using a product improperly could lead to a dangerous, using it dangerously. Um, sanitizers are used on food prep and contact surfaces um, and areas such as uh, mouth toys and pacifiers. So getting to disinfecting. So there is a difference between sanitizing and disinfecting. Disinfecting destroys and inactivates infectious microbes. They frequently have a dwell time, so that's important to look at on the label, to be effective and are used mostly in bathrooms, toilets, and high touch areas. So again, it's an inactivation of germs on hard surfaces or objects if allowed to sit visibly wet. Again, that's that dwell time. And uh, a disinfectant must stay on the surface for at least the recommended dwell time or it will not kill or get rid of all the germs. This may lead to superbugs. And the majority of time as we've been talking to custodians, um, that dwell time is 10 minutes. Okay. Yep. Yep. Can be at least 10 minutes. So, um, you know, we were talk actually talking to a group of custodians not too long ago, and um, some of the custodians use the dwell time. Some, you know, they have a tough job and they have a lot to do. So it's, it is difficult to um, to abide by that. So we're we're aware of the is harder. Um, and what I did want to mention um, was that there was a a study done, which I'll mention actually on the next slide. So why can't we just use a disinfectant cleaner everywhere? We know in schools that you know bleach is, seems to be the friend at a lot of schools. Um, so disinfectants don't necessarily clean the surfaces. So thinking about those Clorox wipes, they're not really doing a good job cleaning the surface. They're maybe, maybe getting rid of some of the germs. And the germs can hide under that dirt and grime and are not affected by them. The products used to disinfect are more toxic and can be more expensive than products used just to clean. Um, and then overusing antimicrobial products or these disinfecting products may lead to the spread of superbugs, like I mentioned. Um, so really, it might see, it seems like a good thing to be breaking out those bleach and wipes, but it might actually be causing a, a worse problem. Um, and it, there was a study that was um, conducted that I found that concluded that cleaning plus disinfecting in those high touch areas is the most effective in eliminating germs and viruses and they found no significant difference in residual contamination after using chlorine bleach versus soap and water. So in some cases, soap and water does a great job on cleaning that sur surface. It's kind of like prepping it to be disinfected. Um, and this will really cut down on the use of those, those really harsh chemicals, only using them in areas either where it's um, mandatory so in some schools, it is mandatory to, to disinfect certain areas um, and just clean, cleaning the rest. Well, and also, Sarah, I'd like to add in that yeah. if um, if you read the directions closely on um, the disinfectant wipes uh, to sanitize slash disinfect, 
you are directed to pre-clean mm -hmm. the surface, then to sanitize, to sanitize, make sure the surface stays wet for 10 seconds and to disinfect, leave on four full minutes, which is the dwell time, then allow the surface to air dry. Yep, and again, um, ask the, you can ask the question, how many of us have been following these directions, even at home? <laughs> and how many are using disinfecting wipes? <laughs> Okay. All right. So now we are moving on to how to read labels. All right. See, so I was talking about reading that disinfectant label. <laughs> okay. With all the chemicals, <laughs> symbols, and fine print, labels can be really confusing, and we'll run through some of the things to look for. Um, identifying the household hazardous products is a difficult task because federal regulations require that certain information appear on hazardous product labels. Um, it's established, the Federal Hazardous Substance Act established labeling requirement for consumer products containing the hazardous substances, but they are only regulated in terms of their acute health effects, not, that's the short term, the chronic health effects are not taken into consideration. And there's also a little caveat that uh, trade secrecy laws allow manufacturers to omit listing or specifically defining ingredients on labels if doing so would cause them economic loss. But what is regulated by the Federal Hazardous Substance Act would be, um, you need to have a single signal word, danger, warning, caution, description of the hazard associated with the product, whether it's flammable, toxic, and corrosive, because if you had just that signal word, it can be very deceiving, it's, we're gonna find out. You have to have the common chemical name for the hazardous ingredient, Instructions for safe use and handling, first aid instructions, name and location of manufacturer or distributor, and then the statement, keep out of reach of children or equivalent. And I'm reminded of a story that one of the custodians shared with us recently where um, two students, it was in an elementary school, and the teacher came upon two students spraying some sort of substance Probably just an air freshener. He didn't say what the substance was. Might have been hydrogen peroxide. Oh, hydrogen peroxide into each other's mouth. So they just were going back and forth, spraying the substance into the house, into the mouths. And um, of course, the teacher panicked. The custodian was one who was on the ball. They were reading the label, trying to figure out what to do. So they had the directions for their first aid instructions. And a bonus was that. Um, you know, they didn't really have the whole chemical list. And fortunately, the custodian had his SDS, his safety, uh, data, sheet. safety data sheet. Thank you, had a brain mm -hmm. fart there. His safety data sheet uh, for that product on site. So he, they were able to find out that it was not hazardous. The signal words are poison, danger, warning, caution, and none. So when you have a danger of poison, it's highly toxic. It's a lethal dose. The lethal dose is a few drops to a teaspoon. And the typical label statement will read fatal if, and the category may include such products as oven cleaners, drain openers, rust removers, and toilet bowl cleaners. So again, if we were doing this live, we have all these great products that we show the labels of. And I have one today that I brought in for my hazardous product kit and it's um, Prestone de-icer and it actually has both just danger and poison and it tells us that it contains methyl alcohol and ethylene glycol. The precautionary measures are listed. Uh, the first aid is listed and to immediately call a poison control center or hospital if uh, it is swallowed and then um, you know, just more of what to do if it's on the skin or in the eyes and to keep out of reach of children. So this this particular, and there weren't many of these because I, I was looking for labels that had danger and or poison on them. And this one I was fortunate to find that had danger and poison on both. A lot of the labels, if they have danger, they don't necessarily have poison written. Um, many things, if used improperly, anything around your house can cause poisoning. And so you have to be sure that you follow the directions closely when using these items and store them out of the reach of a child or adult who
who may use them improperly. Some um, poisonous products that they won't say poison because we have them in our little kit here and they're very common um, are ammonia, bug sprays and traps, cleansers and disinfectants, uh, medicines, of course, but they don't necessarily always say poison. They may say warning. Uh, cosmetics, mothballs, nail polish remover, your antifreeze, uh, paint and paint remover, pesticides and insecticides. I mean, we would hope that people would realize they're poisonous when used incorrectly, but it doesn't say that. And because it's highly toxic, a lethal dose is a few drops to a teaspoon. So that is something that they don't have on the label all the time. I guess they just figure we assume it is, which you really don't want to assume anything. Warning, moderately toxic. Lethal dose is a teaspoon to a tablespoon. So the typical label statement will read, may be fatal if. And this includes uh, such products as your floor cleaners, disinfectant sprays. Our examples of warning, we have the ZEP non-streaking cleaner, which just says warning, causes eye irritation, may be harmful if, if absorbed through the skin. And then another warning item would be your Tylex mold and mildew remover. So, you know, those are maybe fairly the same kind of big cleaners. Let's see what we have for ingredients yet. Yeah, um, this just shows kind of how difficult it can be yep. to find the information on the label. Lots about the storage <laughs> and disposal and the little words about the warning. And like I said, the acute effects and what you have to do for first aid. But I am looking for the specific ingredient and I found it on the ZEP non-streaking cleaner. And, um, you know, contains water, alcohol mixture, ethylene glycol, monobutyl, propane and butane and um, another and I don't see the ingredients listed on my oh it's in the front and it's really tiny and I need stronger reading glass, glasses to read that one but what surprised me with warning and just to show the variety the hand sanitizer so simple little hand sanitizer that you find everywhere is actually has a warning label and it's for external use only. But again, because it has the warning, it's moderately toxic, lethal dose is a teaspoon to a tablespoon. So how many children, if this is everywhere in schools, would start beginning to swallow this stuff, right? Rather than spraying stuff into each other's mouths. Hopefully, but you never know, those little tykes. And mothballs are another one that has warning on it. And so as I've just mentioned, there's lots of this difference, like these, we know mothballs are very dangerous and they're actually fatal if inhaled, which to me is a funny thing to say on the, well, you know, they're always being inhaled, right? You're breathing them. They have quite the vapor to them. Um, so I don't know how much inhalation ends up being fatal. Maybe if you crush it up and snort it, then of course it's very lethal. But uh, we know how those mothballs can really make a closet smell. And you're inhaling that every time you open the door. And then there's caution, which is low toxicity. The lethal dose is an ounce to more than a pint. The lethal dose within the caution category is very broad. Thus, products within the caution category have varying degrees of safety. Some products are very safe, while others may still contain one or more ingredients of concern. Typical label statement will read harmful if. And this is why it's really important that they also include on all of these, and this really hit home for me when I was looking at the caution labels, that the description of the hazard is associated with the product, whether it's flammable, toxic, or corrosive, because lots of things just say caution. I have some brake fluid here that says caution, but it also tells you that if it's poison, and may be harmful or fatal if swallowed. So that's brake fluid. And then we have the disinfectant wipes that we spoke about already. They say caution on them. Um, and that's, that's it, just that's, but we know what that can do to you, being a disinfectant wipe. And then we also have 
the Glade, a just regular freshener, air freshener. That also says caution, but it does let us know that it's flammable and you don't want to be near a fire when you spray it. So different products, and we had quite a bit of caution products, then quite a different degree of what one would think was safe and not. Another one that said caution was the termite and carpet ant killer. And so that just tells you, you know, disinfectant wipes and a termite and ant carpenter ant killer. I think Raid was in with the caution as well. And then we have no signal words. So these are the least toxic. No precautionary statements are required. Uh, caution signal word is optional. And so, you know, our green wipes, the green works compostable cleaning wipes, they don't have um, any signal word on them, but they do tell you the ingredients and they do tell you to keep out of reach of children and pets and directions for use. We have tidy bowl uh, powerful cleaning detergents for your toilet and it actually has no signal word at all on it. It just tells you to keep out of reach of children and directions for use. And if you looked up the ingredients, no ingredients listed on here, but if you looked it up on the SDS, you would definitely see that there are some strong ingredients in here that I think a signal word should be on the label. And we have silver polish. That has no signal word, no caution. It just tells you how to use it. And our seventh generation dishwasher detergent gel. Um, again, it's, it's more of the green product, so it doesn't have any um, signal word on it. Just again, keep out of reach of children. I thought we had one about the green cleaners, but maybe we're going to come up to that one later. Okay, we'll get more about the green cleaners <laughs> later. Okay, so uh, we have here what's called the OSHA Quick Card Hazard Communication Standard Pictogram. Our, uh, these pictograms are a standard visual reference of the types of hazards a product may present. Um, so you might have this hanging up if maybe if you're a custodian. Um, we did hand these out to custodians at our last conference, so it was really good. You can find them online at this link here. Um, and again, the, this presentation will be available, so you can, you'll be able to look this up if you miss it today. Um, so how many of you are familiar with this card or any of the pictograms on here? Um, and these are mostly found on an SDS sheet, and I'll talk about um, at the end I'll have, I have an example SDS sheet here, um, formerly known as MSDS. So if you know about the material safety data sheets, the powers that be changed it to safety data sheets. So same thing, just a different name. And these are all required in schools, the safety data sheets, not what we're looking at here. But just to mention that um, all schools should have a binder of the safety data sheets available on hand. So just going through what each one means briefly. So we have a health hazard one, which is a, the human pictogram on here, meaning that a product, if it has this kind of label, it could be um, carcinogen or a mut mutagenicity, reproductive toxicity. So this one kind of is definitely a very harmful product if it has this type of, of label on it. Um, and I do have a you know, the Prestone product, so the de-icer windshield washer, and it has this type of uh, health hazard on it. So, you know, if we use our de-icer in the winter, we definitely don't want to get this on our skin or, or breathe it in. And then just to mention again, I read the label from the de-icer because that was the one that had a danger of poison, but we did not have the OSHA quick card right. symbol because they don't have to put that on the label. Yep. So the next one is a flame. It's pretty. This one's pretty obvious. It's flammable. Um, it could be self-heating. It could react with another. If you mix it with another chemical, it could be self-reactive, and um, pretty 
pretty self-explanatory, this, this guy with the flame. Uh, we have the exclamation mark, which is a skin and eye irritant. Um, skin sensitizer could um, interfere with respiratory tract, hazardous to ozone layer. Um, so that's another whole whole can of worms there with, with what's mandatory for, for that. Gas cylinder, gas is under pressure. So definitely want to be weary of that. Corrosion. So this means that if it touches your skin or corrosive to metals, it could um, severely burn your skin and, and damage, and especially you don't want to get it anywhere near your eyes. Exploding bomb sounds pretty, <laughs> pretty good. Explosive, self-reactive, and um, the organic peroxides, which is, um, according to the Canadian Center for Occupational Health and Safety, most undiluted organic peroxides can catch fire easily and burn very rapidly and intensely. This is because they combine both fuel, carbon and oxygen in the same compound. Some organic peroxides are dangerously reactive. They can decompose rapidly or explosively if they are exposed to only slight heat, friction, mechanical shock or contamination with incompatible materials. So you want to be very aware of the products you're using that have this kind of reactivity to it. Um, so that just shows knowing what these labels mean is very important. Then we have the oxidizer group. Oh, the flame over circle. Yes, flame over circle indicates oxidizers. Um, Again, oxidizing materials are liquids or solids that readily give off oxygen or other oxidizing substances. This reaction may be spontaneous at either room temperature or may occur under slight heating. Oxidi oxidizing liquids and solids can be severe fire and explosion hazards. Um, they're used to make rocket fuel to burn in space where no oxygen is available. Um, so that's maybe why you can see the cylinder below the flame. And it's also, um you know, chlorine, fluorine, and bromine are some, some of these substances that fall under oxidizer. In the environment, so, um, you know, it'll affect the, if it's affect the environment, if it's released. Um, the dead fish is a pretty good indicator that the substance shouldn't be released into groundwater. But as we all know, as we're using these um, substances, these conventional cleaning chemicals, once you spray it on something or if you're using it, it's going to eventually end up in the environment. Um, so this one's aquatic. It's toxic to aquatic life. So that means it's also quite um, toxic to us as well. Bone crossbones. So most of us recognize this symbol as fatal or toxic. So we just want to, uh, you know, really be, be mindful when we see this one. So it says, uh, this is a label example. Um, I don't know, you, you might have seen them out there. I actually haven't seen, seen them on labeled on bottles or anything, uh, but this is what a sample label might have. This, the pictogram shows that this one is a health hazard as well as flammable and has a danger warning underneath, meaning it could be fatal. There's an emergency contact number under the company name, some precautions, what to do in a fire, and how to administer first aid. I've only seen these directions in the safety data sheet for the most part. Um, so that's why it's important to keep those SDS sheets on hand. And again, this is actually an example that Weber packaging uses. Pentagram used our flame, exclamation mark, and corrosion, and there's a danger signal word here. So you don't want to be filling this anywhere or getting it near heat or on your skin. Um, and this will give you some instructions on what to do. Right. Okay, and then more information that you will find in your SDS sheets, but not on your labels. Um, these are a next set of labels are from the Hazardous Materials Information System, and this system uses standard colors and numbers from zero to four, and so zero being the lowest risk, and four being the highest. Um, 
if we have um, the, the blue part has to do with health, so the numbers in the list could be zero for no significant risk to you, or for four, life-threatening major or permanent damage may result from single or repeated exposure. Also, there is now a second box on this line, uh, which we will also show in one of the other examples. There's an asterisk that they use that indicates the chronic health hazard and some of these. So if you, if you see a label that has a little asterisk next to the health, vulnerability, physical health, or personal protection, that will tell you that there's a chronic health hazard associated with it. Red is flammability. Um, the criteria used to sign again, zero to four, four being the high hazard. It's identical to those used by the National Fire Protection Association. Um, and for the HMIS-3, the flammability criteria are defined according to OSHA standards. Yellow is physical or orange is physical hazard. And again, it can go from zero, normally stable, to four, which is readily explosive or reaction. So there are water reactives, organic peroxides, explosives, compressed gases, pyrophoric materials, oxidizers, and unstable reactives. And I'm just pausing so you have a chance to read the slide some more if you want to. And I don't really need to read it out loud to you. And then white. Um, this is the personal protection. So for the white label, um, it uses a lettering system rather than the number system. As you can see here, if it had an A, then you just need safety glasses. Um, if it had an L, you need to use your custom PPE specified by the employer. So, you know, it just indicates what your personal protective equipment should be when you're uh, working with this material. And so they, they would, you know, they could give you a F, an I, a K. They can give you a few letters. And so here we have an example. So there's that asterisk on the health. And so that's meaning it's chronic. Um, and the number two lets you know that it's um, slightly that's sort of mid mid ground temporary or minor injury temporary minor injury and then the flammability is out of three so it is flammable and the reactivity is at a zero so you don't have to worry mm -hmm. about that and your personal protection would be an h which is flash goggles gloves apron and a vapor respirator And again, those are found on the SDS sheets. And, you know, it's interesting because now that we all have computers on our phones, um, even if you don't have an SDS sheet mm -hmm. handy, like, you know, if the custodian, yes, we expect them to have that SDS. If you're in an institution or manufacturing or something like that, you have to have that on site. Um, but if you're just a person shopping, and you can always look up the yep. SDS. You can look up the product in the SDS sheet before you buy that product if you're curious and see what else is there rather than what they wrote on the label for you. There's a lot of good uh, websites out there that we talk about in our Healthy Home Clean Waters, uh, that, which will be available online that you can look, look at to see what those companies are that actually helps you put a company name or a product name into the search engine. It'll show you the... Um, hazards of that certain product. So there's a lot of good online information out there. So now we'll be talking about finding better products, um, gentler green labels. As stated in the beginning, conventional cleaning products can be harmful to anyone coming in contact with the product, both user and surface. Newer, safer cleaning products are now on the market. 10 years ago, the product may not have been as effective Newer science and technology have created safe, effective cleaning products. Um, so what to look for in safer cleaning products? We want to see that they disclose all ingredients on the label, which we actually have a 
a um, example here of the seventh generation. Um, we can see all the products listed on the ingredients there. Um, no harsh signal words, so we won't see poison, danger, warning, or caution, um, which are mandatory for, for certain chemicals. Um, plant or bio-based ingredients, pH neutral, non-aerosol, and no overwhelming chemical odor. And um, when I think of that, there are some cleaning, cleaning products out there that are green, and they actually do kind of have a more heavy odor. Um, so basically, you want to look for something with less odor, because then you know that those VOCs are, aren't as high. The third party certification. According to the National Science Foundation, or uh, sorry, formerly National Sanitation Foundation International, um, companies are not required to disclose every ingredient, only ingredients deemed hazardous. So how do we differentiate the safe from the harmful? That's where third party reviews, third party certification or review comes in. It's an usually an independent organization reviewing the manufacturing process of a product and independently determining that the final product complies with specific standards for safety, quality, or performance. Um, so it, there's a couple of companies out there that we will identify. So when you see those type of labels, you know that it was reviewed by an independent organization. And here they are. So <clears throat> these are the most commonly found labels. Uh, I think these are your best bet for how to know that these are these are safe to use. So you have the Ego logo from Underwriters Laboratories, the Green Seal Certified, and EPA has their own safer choice, um, which you can find on the website. And the examples that we have here um, do have those labels on them. So you can be assured that these products have been tested and meet the, the standards that they set. So state requirements for indoor air quality. So you should always check with your state if you're from Massachusetts, if you're from Connecticut, state, uh, check with your state requirements for indoor air quality. And we're talking specifically about schools. Um, the following examples of what um, we're looking at New Hampshire and Vermont today as examples. Okay, so Vermont state law, they adopted the Envision program so it's promoting healthy school environments and was created from Act 125, helps schools identify, prevent, and problem solve potential environmental health and indoor quality issues by providing a model for environmental health management plan and policy. So Envision school Vision gives schools tools and training and technical assistance to create and maintain a healthier school environment. Um, so basically, it's, they list it as environmentally preferable, looking at products that are environmentally preferable under state contracts. So that's a mandatory thing they put in there, so they have to offer these products. Certified as environmentally preferable by an independent third party, which includes air fresheners, but excludes disinfectants because those are, um, those are mandatory to be used in schools and disinfectants don't have the yeah. Yeah, we haven't yet found yeah. uh, a green yeah. disinfectant. So looking at New Hampshire. So the school principal or designee shall annually investigate air quality checklists, which are uh, given to schools by the Department of Education, shall remain on file for five years. And they are Actually, you can see here that um, schools must have copies of the EPA's Tools for Schools program on hand, which we'll talk about. We'll describe what that is. But the law does not say that they have to use them, which we found in almost 100% of the schools that they either have never heard of this program or they haven't used it. So it was a good thought at the time to have New Hampshire schools have this program, but they didn't help implement it. Um, Department of Education is very interested in seeing the Tools for Schools program used, but it's really not enforced. And if any of you out there are familiar with it, let us know, because we'll be excited to know that you use it. Um, this is a sample of what the checklist looks like. It varies year to year. They do change it up. 
and I believe it's an online version now, um, but this is kind of what it looks like. Um, very similar to what we offer. Right, and actually, you know, at the end of the school year, the uh, principals receive an email at the end of April with the online IAQ reporting form uh, to give them enough chance to get it in because it's due on June 30th every year. Yep. So that is the good part that schools in New Hampshire are should be filling out this checklist every year. So looking at routine inspections, um, reporting, integrated pest management, training, um, looking if they are testing for radon. <clears throat> so then we get to the NRA school indoor air quality report. So this is a sample of what we will do when we do a walkthrough of your school. This is the report that you would get um, to be able to share with your custodian and administrative staff. Um, and the walkthrough usually yeah. takes like two to three hours. We're, we're learning how to make it a little bit quicker. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it definitely, we, we plan on two hours when we do a walkthrough. Yeah. And it, it is really the size of the school is yeah. what determines. How many chemicals we have to look at. <laughs> And so the report um, has some, just some basic information at the beginning, number of buildings, square footage, what goals you know we're looking to accomplish. And some of that stuff we can do offsite. You know, we could call ahead of time to take care of those uh, yep. logistics and you know square footage and all that stuff. Looking at current good practices of what great things you're doing. And then we go into, um, you know, what we found at the school and give you some information on, on what that means. And these are some more findings and recommendations. And again, when we go into a school and talk to custodians, we want them to know that we're not telling them how to do their job. We know they do a great job at what they do. Um, these are just ways to help improve the school indoor air quality for everybody there, including the custodians that are handling these products every day. So we're trying to make them aware that <clears throat> the products might be harming them and there's options out there to, right. to change. That there are alternatives. And that's where we, you know, when we set up the action plan steps, we set up with the baby steps first, the simplest things that can be done that aren't going to rock anyone's boat too much or, yep. um, you know, have to get a lot of administration involved and then we will, you know, bring it to the things that would be really good to do if they are, but may take a little bit more planning. Right, we have our, and we do note the, um, our uh, green, right, the, the third party certified products that you're using. And then, so the product review is, which I think we'll see on the next page here. Yeah. So we, <clears throat> we take all the chemicals that are in the closet and put them on this sheet. And then we look up their SBS sheets and we tell you which ones are particularly harmful and which ones are third party certified. And then if they're being currently in use, because we find that there's many custodians departments out there that have chemicals that they haven't used in five to 10 years, but they don't want to obviously pour it down the drain. They don't want to dispose of it in an incorrect way, but they don't know where to go with it. Um, so there's these products that um, custodians hang on to, but really if you haven't used it for three or more years, that's where we recommend and bring in the, your local transfer station right. that do, does the household hazardous waste days. Right, and that's what, you know, the, again, the purpose of this grant for this year, and that's why IAQ was a, a big portion of it, because it is an area where we can marry the, the town with the school and benefit both of them. And uh, it's been wonderful, because we have had transfer station attendants coming to the schools, doing some of the IAQ walkthroughs with us, and, and helping the school get rid of those old chemicals that were in the back corner yep. of the shelf. And of course, there's a fee for it, but it's not going to be as large of a fee as if they had to have the hazardous waste company come to their school and collect it on site. Uh, and there were some some cases, not in New Hampshire, but um, I was reading in some cases where schools were fined for having hazardous products that they weren't supposed to have. So 
really saves that time and energy, you know, paying fines for having these when we can just help you dispose of them properly. So this is uh, what some of the, ch the chemicals that are out there. It's not an exhaustive list, not everything that's out there, but the main ones that have the most health concerns. So we'll, we'll list on the far right the products that are out of school and have those types of chemicals. So we'll do yeah. that research for you. It's called our product review. And you know we'll let you know those health concerns um, as well. This one just points out uh, chlorine. So it can cause cardiovascular, gastrointestinal, kidney problems, whole list of, of problems if chlorine is used incorrectly or ex you're exposed to them. Another one for antifreeze. And these are two very common materials that we find on site as we do in our IAQs. So it's ethylene glycol. Um, more examples. Yeah, just more examples. So as you can see, we every single product that we find we review it. Toluene, which is a health threat to children and I'm sure to adults. It's commonly used in spray paints and primers, uh, multi-purpose cleaners, contact cement, floor polish, paint thinners, bath mats, and wood sealers. It's um, a colorless water ins insoluble flammable liquid having a benzene-like odor. It's obtained chiefly from coal tar and petroleum and it's used as a solvent in the manufacture of the benzoic acid, benzaldehyde, TNT, and other organic compounds. Yeah, this Very is, stuff. <laughs> that's one that we really flag. <laughs> so after we wrap up the table um, product review, we'll review the facts about commonly used products such as aerosol propellant and antibacterial soaps. Fragrances have been banned from many conferences or schools are coming on board with that now. Fragrance is now recognized as a common trigger of asthma attacks, migraines, allergy reactions, and sinus problems. So why not having a little air freshener in the classroom is probably, you know, could be harmful to some students that are asthma. And I'm just re um, listing some additional health threats to children. Um, we finish up with vinyl composite tiles, volatile organic compounds, and even whiteboard cleaners. These last few pages of the report are full of resources and links. Everything that we've been talking about today um, and more are listed in these resources um, that will really help in guiding you through, through this process. And then we also bring back the um, HMIS reference sheet that's a part of the report. And, and we do this because the custodian may be familiar with it, but this report is going to the principal and administration as well, and mm -hmm. they may not be. So, you know, one, one thing we really like to do with the IAQ report is give the kudos to the custodians and make everyone aware that they really do have a difficult job and they're, I think they're underappreciated and all that they have to take care of. And so this, you know, the last two pages have the reference charts that we already reviewed. So we have the HMIS and then we have the OSHA quick card. So it's, it's a part of the report. And then here we just have a few examples of uh, what we have seen on some of our walkthroughs. Uh, entry mats at the school entrance help to reduce contaminants from being tracked into the school. And there's a lot to, about that. Um, when we went to the Vermont Custodian Conference, we pretty much sat in on one workshop for an hour where half of it was all about mats. Who would have known the, the different piling and the different pattern and which ones should be used where at the entrance outside to when you get inside to when you go further down the hall. Um, and so, yeah, we give all that in our report too, the uh, recommended length of these mats. Then we have here evidence of water leaks in the ceiling tiles, right? Consider doing routine check of your ceiling to see if new areas are spotted. Mold and mildew can occur from that. Chemicals in the art classroom. Um, SDS, the SDS sheets for these chemicals. Um, not many of the art teachers have the SDS sheets I've noticed in the elementary schools. Elementary, they might have to have them in the um, high school and where they have 
um, more professional. Yeah, like more hydrated. advanced. Yeah. yeah. And then we also always find dust and other pollutants that collect in the couches and pillows. And looking at exterior observations, what's going on outside the building, um, clear signage indicating that bus engines should not be idling. So, so having some good uh, idling policies, um, open lid on dumpsters, you know, might attract smells and pests, consider working with the trash company to ensure the lid's always down. Evidence that composting is taking place at school, which, you know, that's becoming very popular. Um, but make sure it's very secure and that it, the system's being maintained properly to get, you know, not to secure from those pests. Looking at air intake of the roof, um, not very far from plumbing or sewer, sewer vents. I haven't actually found too many of those cases, but. Um, and also looking at snow, where snow and water collects on building it could also affect the indoor environment. All right, so there are many resources available to help improve the IAQ. And as we said, the part of the USDA grant funding used to produce this webinar is being used to create a hazardous materials management tool. So we didn't tell you that part yet, which will assist schools and organizations to become greener. So we put together the IAQ, doing the IAQ assessments, giving you your IAQ report. And we also have a hazardous materials management uh, document manual that we're updating and uh, improving so that will and that's split between all the different departments in the school we also have our teaching toxics that's our um, curriculum that we tied to the national common core standards it's k through 12 and it's available for educators to use in the classroom and we have our uh, live webinars and we just did that healthy home clean waters that i mentioned on june 8th and that addresses the toxins in our environment. So any of these resources that we have that we've been creating now over the couple the last couple of years, thank you to USDA, um, can be uh, found if you just want to contact info at nrra.net, um, and you can get more information about that. Don't really know what that video. Oh. It's just three o'clock now, so maybe yeah. we'll just continue on. Yeah. Um, okay. And if you want to watch the video of the um, the water activity, then you can watch Healthy Homes, Clean Waters, and be able to see how how we do that activity and how it can be done in the classroom. Um, so that'll be available online, and to be able to to watch that. Right. So that's the four to six activity that was in Teaching Top Six, uh, wading through water pollution. So we mentioned before that EPA tools for IAQ tools for schools toolbox. They were widely distributed in New Hampshire um, a few years ago, but due to class, they're no longer offered in print. Now you can find everything online. Um, as you, we mentioned, New Hampshire principals receive a checklist every year. Um, so when they're going through their checklist, this will actually help them um, find more information. Here's the contact information. Um, yes, at the bottom here, if you're have questions um, for New Hampshire Department of Education about that program. She's a uh, Marjorie Schoonmaker, the Safe and Healthy Schools Educator. And the Tools for Schools website um, has online certification for educators with a series of 10 webinars related to IAQ. Um, the direct link is right here to the EPA site. And don't forget that this entire presentation will be available as a recording. So if you miss any of the links or references, they will be available at a later date. And um, yeah, you get a certificate of completion for finishing this webinar. And I'm actually thinking of the EPA too. They give yeah. a certificate of completion for all of their webinars. Mm -hmm. yeah, they have really, really great uh, webinars on their site. Um, EPA also has the mobile app for IAQ, which is great for custodians on the move. So that's really, really great to have those checklists on, on hand. And again, the EPA state school environmental health guidelines. They, yeah, I, you know, I just want to say I was yeah. personally surprised as we embarked on the indoor air quality this uh, since September, we've been doing a lot of research on it and doing our walkthroughs and learning a lot. I have to speak for myself, I learned a lot. Um, and so watching the EPA 
uh, webinars. Uh, they're, they're just fantastic. I was surprised at how much information EPA has on IAQ, and they're really focusing on it. Um, and the webinars, one could be just about asthma, and then another one is just about radon. I mean, yep. they really, they get very specific, and it's not an overall like ours was today. And other resources um, for green cleaning. So you have informed green solutions. So uh, safer indoor and air, safer indoor environments through purchasing decisions. So there's a link for that. And that's Carol Westinghouse again. Then we have the Healthy Schools Network. Um, so you can check that out. And the Chemical Abstract Service Registry number, which actually is the number that is with every chemical out there. Um, so it just helps keep track. Um, Universal is universally used to provide unique, unmistakable identifiers. So those are really helpful when you're looking at the chemical. Right, and we put that on our sheets, that product review sheet that we showed you for the IAQ assessment. And then these are the live webinars. Um, we already did the Healthy Home Clean Waters. We're about done with indoor air quality and green cleaning. And then the last one upcoming on July 10th at 1 p.m. is Things That Go Boom and it analyzes hazardous substance dropped off at the transfer station, how to distinguish and separate types of hazardous waste and dispose of safely according to state and federal laws. And um, the custodians got a laugh out of this one because they thought we should be doing it before July 4th, not after okay. July 4th. And these are is all the information that we've gathered for this webinar. These are all the sources for them. So if you're wondering how we came to a certain uh, facts, you can look them all up here. Some really good information on here. Um, you know, OSHA from the state of New Hampshire. These are all our sources you can re use as a reference. And so thank you again for participating in our presentation. And we really welcome your feedback. We would love to hear what you have to say about it, comments, any more questions. Um, and so please take a moment to answer the survey. That will happen once you click off of this um, to receive your certificate of completion. Um, and if you do, uh, we already we have a school indoor air quality survey on the site, the club at nrra.net. We had actually started off the grant year with that just to get an assessment of who knew anything about indoor air quality in their schools. And it's still up there and we would love for you to take that as well. And if you do take that one, we will send you our three green cleaning recipe booklets. But just taking that school survey. So those are two different things. The webinar evaluation, mm -hmm. that's for this to get your professional development credits or your CEUs. And then the other thing is the indoor air quality survey. And that you won't get any professional development credits for, but you will get three green cleaning recipe booklets yep. from and us. For some reason, the survey doesn't pop up at the end of this webinar. Um, you, it will be emailed to you. So you can take it if you don't have time later, just to give you some options. Okay, and let's just, just see if we have any questions. I know we went over time. No questions. Oh, wait, wait. Let's just give it a few seconds. Just maybe you guys want to mull over the information that we that we gave you. And again, we hope that um, this information is kind of shared with custodians, with school staff, with transfer station attendants. I know we've had a good mix of people attending these webinars. Um, and if there's any information that you want to share with us as well, um, yeah. Oh, we do have one that yeah. just came in. Um, some of our teachers use Lysol wipes. Should they be switching to baby wipes? So, um, yeah, so what we noticed at school is some teachers bring in their own materials, which is something that we recommend changing that policy and actually make it in a school policy that you can't bring in your own cleaning chemicals. Like we talked about, Lysol wipes aren't great cleaners per se, they disinfect. Um, so. Using baby wipes is an alternative. We, recommend, we would actually recommend using a microfiber cloth with a green cleaning product, um, but the, the baby wipes are a lot less harsh, right? and they actually do a better job cleaning. Um, so yeah, to answer that question, but baby wipes are fine. Right, and again, they're good for the cleaning. They're not so hot for the sanitizing. 
Um, but you know, also when we think about that, if the teacher is wiping the table for her own class, the custodian's going to come through at the end of the day, and they are the ones that know that they have to do the sanitizing. Uh, so you know, it's just best to let those students use the baby wipes and just do that soap and water cleaning yep. that needs to be done. Uh, yep. Leave it to the custodian for them to really do the deep cleaning. Um, and Sarah, do you want to share that one little lunchroom observation you had quickly about the, the chlorine um, wipes, the chlorine and the water uh, there dilution? Was, I won't mention the school, but there is a school that, um, that we visited that was having the students wash the tables, which is great um, to involve them, but they were using um, using a diluted chlorine washcloth and the students were actually using them but with no um, personal protective equipment. So uh, we re don't recommend, that's something that we would recommend using a better product, a cleaner, greener product for if students are especially handling these. Chlorine is definitely um, harsh on the hands and it can actually cause burns. Um, so and that was a surprising step to find. So that's, you know, schools, that, that's where the education comes in. Um, you know, they don't mean to be doing this, um, didn't know it was harmful. So I'm kind of glad that we exactly do that. That's yeah. why we go through and do the mm -hmm. IAQ assessments and we're very kind. Um, so I guess that is it. I don't see any more any questions more? coming in. More? Okay. Definitely email us, give us a call, the number up here. Um, we're always welcome. We're here to answer questions. Great. Yep. And so this concludes our PowerPoint. Thank you very, very much.